Ride Show. Welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I am the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and I've recorded more than 5,000 interviews going back to 2003, all of which are available at scotthorton.org. We can also sign up for the podcast feed. The full archive is also available at youtube.com slash Show. All right, you guys, on the line, I've got our good friend Ray McGovern, the great Ray McGovern. For 27 years, he was a CIA analyst, head of the Soviet division during the Cold War, briefer to Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush in the 80s. But uh, this whole century long, he's been doing everything he can to oppose the wars. Well, and to tell the truth about them, which is the same thing. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing, Ray? I'm doing well. Scott, how are you? I'm doing great. Appreciate you joining us here today. And uh, I should have said that you are co-founder of Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity and write regularly at raymcgovern.com, consortiumnews.com, and of course, antiwar.com. So very happy to tell everybody about that. And uh, including and especially here, two important pieces for consortiumnews.com. One, destroying the eminently destroyable... Colin Powell, and the other one, presumptuous Pompeo pushes preposterous Peking policy. <laughs> Wonderful alliteration uh, from the great Ray McGovern there at consortiumnews.com. But let's start with Colin Powell and his song of himself in the New York Times magazine here. I have to say, uh, to start this off, Ray, that when I argue the, the war on terrorism was unnecessary, didn't have to be this way, et cetera, et cetera. I like to say, forget Al Gore or any of that. Just if George Bush had listened to Colin Powell, which is what the American people thought they were electing, Colin Powell to run the foreign policy, they trusted him. And if only it had not been Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld, Paul Wolfowitz, Richard Pearl, Scooter Libby, Stephen Hadley and Abram Shulsky and Douglas Fife and the neoconservative cabal. If Bush had just listened to Powell, none of this would have happened. I mean, they would have still had a terrible war in Afghanistan. But all of the rest of Iraq and then therefore Libya, Syria, Yemen, and the whole dang special ops war across Africa, drone wars in Pakistan, never would have happened. It didn't have to be this way at all. And so I'm giving the guy credit there. That he really did tell Bush, you should not do this. But then what'd he do, Ray? He clicked his heels. He went out there and lied the American people and the world into the case for launching Iraq War II. And now here he is, 20 years later, 17, wants to tell the New York Times and the author of this new book, uh, Robert Draper, wrote this new book, To Start a War, coming out, that, you know, it's not my fault. And geez, don't write, light us into war on my tombstone, right? Sort of try to stop it a little bit. What do you think? Well, I think we've got it mostly right, as usual, Scott. Um, the question is how forcibly he argued his case. Um, he caved, um, well, he caved as soon as, uh, as he puts it uh, in the quotation from, from the book, uh, because the president said so, and the president said so, hey, the president ordered it, right? Well, this betrays a kind of military uh, mind that uh, forgets, and I have personal experience of this, uh, forgets that the oath we all take uh, as uh, as officers or as uh, as troops um, to to uh, support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. It's the Constitution. <laughs> it's not the president that, they swear, that we swear fealty to. Now, my personal experience of this is, uh, oh, it must be about 15 years ago, I was lecturing at the Naval Academy in Annapolis. I had a friendly uh, uh, professor there who, who invited me to speak. And as I watched, uh, well, first of all, uh, the cafeteria TVs were all set on Fox, and and I kind of detected kind of a um, a loyalist to the president 
uh, flavor from the questions they were asking. But then I finally asked them, I said, okay, so you all, you all swore, swore a solemn oath before you became cadets here or midshipmen. Uh, what was that oath? And uh, uh, one guy said, well, it's the president. <laughs> and then I said, yeah, do you all think it's for the president? Well, yeah, it's for the president. I said, my God, that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and they all looked at me like I had a, a you know, two heads. And somebody said, oh, that's right. Yeah, it's the Constitution. Well, you know, <laughs> that's why we're in this business. That's why I came in this business. And that's why we're still trying to uh, defend, we're still trying to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And that may sound quaint and it may sound obsolete to a guy like John Yu or, or Alberto Gonzalez, but it's the truth. And the fact that these these were, these were, I don't know what they call them, juniors, okay? They were third year people, midshipmen in Annapolis, and they automatically said, I swear a solemn oath to the president. So. Maybe Powell gleaned that in his long career in, in, in the president, uh, in the uh, armed, in the ranks of the army. Uh, but I think it's also a factor of who Colin Powell is. I know Colin Powell. Um, I grew up about a mile from him in the Bronx. He was a year ahead of me. He at the City College, I at Fordham. He was ROTC as I was. Uh, he was distinguished military graduate, as I was, uh, but he went into the regular army, and he learned that as long as you salute smartly, man, you are your career is made. A little more so if you had certain advantages like him. Uh, he was smart, and he was also a minority, and that helped as well. So when you have that kind of background, you're gonna you're gonna salute and you're gonna lie and you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna cheat and you're gonna steal. If I can paraphrase someone else, uh, Pompeo, uh, who uh, graduated first in his class from from uh, uh, the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. So all my all I'm saying is that he was kind of um, he was used to used to just doing what the president said. And yes, he's on the record as uh, having. Uh, thought that this was a bad idea. But as soon as push came to shove, I hate to say it, but he caved. And the the title given this New York Times uh, Magazine article, uh, Colin Powell still wants answers. Well, you know, I'm sorry. He had the answers. He knew the answers then. He knew the real answers. And he told us a bunch of lies. The only consolation I get is that I kind of sense this, and uh, as our first issuance, our first memo to the president, you see, we still, even even we, still thought that there was a chance that Bush was being deceived, that he was being railroaded into this by all those, all those gentlemen, and I use the term loosely, that you just mentioned, and especially Cheney and Rumsfeld, of course. So, so as long as there was a chance that it needed, needed some truth, well, we sat down, watched the thing, we, the veteran intelligence professionals for sanity watched this presentation. I do a, did a quick and dirty memo that same afternoon and got it out on the AFP wire and in other means that, that at 5:30 that afternoon. So we told the president, "Look, we give Colin Powell a C for content. Uh, we think uh, we think you really better." Uh, widen your circle of advisors, Mr. President, beyond those clearly focused on a war for which we see no compelling reason, and from which, and these were our words, and from which we believe the, the uh, unintended consequences uh, are likely to be catastrophic, period, end quote. I remember, I, I wrote that last paragraph, and I remember thinking, you know, I hope you're wrong, McGovern. I hope you know. I hope you're just kind of hyper here, but it wasn't wrong. Our, our colleagues weren't wrong. Yeah. And and uh, again, that what, wasn't just you and some friends. That was the veteran intelligence professionals for Sandy, virtually all at that time. I think former CIA officers saying, "Look, we know this isn't right." That's correct. Yeah. And uh, you know, people would say, "Well, how do you know? <laughs> you're retired. You don't have any access to uh, classified information." Well, you know it was a lie too, Scott. Did That's right. In fact, let me just say real quick, and I'm not saying just bragging for myself or whatever, but I'm speaking for 
all the cab drivers and all the bartenders and, for that matter, all the drunks in Austin, Texas. I mean, the professional Wednesday drunks in Austin, Texas in the year 2003. Um, I was painting a house with my friend Adam listening to Colin Powell's speech on NPR on my uh, truck's radio. And I debunked every bit of it in real time to my buddy Adam as he was talking. So, well, I don't know about this Zarqawi guy, but I'm sure that's BS too. But the rest of it, the mobile biological weapons labs and the aluminum tubes and all of this stuff, we already knew for a fact those things weren't true. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm recalling uh, not a favorite person of mine, but the fellow was named uh, Bill Casey, and he headed up the CIA. Uh, he was the director. And uh, Barbara Honecker, who uh, was there when uh, the, the Reagan cabinet in 1981, it was early February, when the cabinet assembled and each uh, each of the cabinet officers were asked to uh, to say what they're trying to do and what their mission is. And, and Bill Casey said, uh, you know, our mission will be complete when every when uh, everything we tell the American people is a lie and they believe it. <laughs> no, I didn't make that up. Barbara Honiger was there. Did she report it contemporaneously? She did. Yeah. But the other thing I want to mention about this is Casey also said, you know, the, the, the biggest surprise I got taking over the CIA was that, you know, about 85, 90 percent of the of the material they use comes out of open sources for Pete's sake. Can you imagine? Now, here's Casey, you know, an old spy master from World War II. Nothing counted unless you had some informant telling you something that he, he or she said was, you know, really golden. And here he is realizing for the first time that you can glean important conclusions just by looking at the, the reportage, just not by knowing who's reporting what for the New York Times. And as you painting that house with Adam and the cab drivers in Austin, Texas, you know, it's not hard. It's not hard if you have an open mind. But, you know, if you're thinking of maybe conquering country, removing a dictator, Saddam Hussein, and uh, maybe getting a, a you know, real in on the oil there, and maybe you know permanent military bases there. Well, you know you don't give a rat's patootie about what's true or not. You advertise this, and uh, they picked Colin Powell. You know it was clear why they picked him. He knew better than anybody. He had immense respect at that point. He could have run for president. And uh, Dick Cheney, of all people, says. Uh, uh, Colin, you have the best, uh, you have the best face here. You had the best record. You're the guy to do it. Now put that into play. <laughs> Colin. Now, so, so I know how the whole thing went down. It was really pretty bad. There are lessons for today because when the, pre when the vice president, Scooter Libby and, and, and these, these guys collected all this trash and I, you know, trash is a, a, a mild word here about A, weapons of mass destruction and B, uh, ties between uh, so-called ties between Saddam Hussein and Al Qaeda and put it all in a draft and say, OK, here, Colonel Wilkerson, who was uh, putting this piece together, here's uh, here's what you need to say. And Larry says, my God, you know. It took me three hours to get through the first three pages. It was all cockamamie stuff. And I said to, to my boss, Colin Powell, now we can't go with this. And he looked at it. He said, well, you know, um, and we can't. We only have five days. Can we start from scratch? And that just then on the scene appears uh, the master deceiver, a fellow named George Tennant who is the, the epitome of somebody who caves to whatever the president says. And he said, oh, no problem. We have a national intelligence estimate, uh, the ACME of intelligence analysis. It's subscribed to all 16 intelligence agencies. And we know that that says weapons of mass destruction, weapons of mass destruction, weapons of mass destruction, and also says that there's a nexus between Saddam Hussein and Al Qaeda, uh, most people believe that Saddam Hussein had something to do with 9 11. Uh, remember now, this is 2002, okay? That's a year, not even a year later. 
Uh, and so we'll go with the we'll go with the estimate. Now, Colin Powell knew damn well that the estimate was garbage. How do you know that? Because his own intelligence people told him that. They took copious footnotes. Well, now, wait a minute. Explain for a second. What does that mean, his own intelligence people at the State Department? People don't know about that. Good. Yeah, that's important to know. Um, There's an intelligence unit. It's called INR, the Bureau for Intelligence and Research. And it's been with the State Department forever. It has an incredibly good reputation, small as it is, maybe smaller is better. But meaning that he wasn't dependent on the military or the CIA. He had his own guys and loyal to him, too. Right. Honest to him. Yeah. So he knew where his own people stood. Now, here's the question. Why didn't he have the head of INR or the deputy head of INR, both of whom were pretty stalwart? honest people, why didn't he have them help out Larry Wilkerson? Well, maybe Larry didn't ask him. False. Larry did ask him. He said, I'm not going to go up there at the CIA and be subjected to the blandishments of George Tenet and John McLaughlin alone. For God's sake, let me have my, let me have your head of intelligence call Ford or failing that the deputy Tom Finger. Both of those guys are really golden. Okay. And Colin Powell says no. Why the hell would he say no? Well, because those men have integrity. Simple as that. Yeah, he justified it by telling uh, telling Larry, "Look, you know, I know who I know what they feel. Uh, I can call them any time." Well, as I reconstruct this now, and just this morning, it occurred to me, Colin Powell was probably told by the vice president or someone like that, Rumsfeld, "We don't want any of these dissident." INR, State Department intelligence guys around. They're just going to prolong the process. They're going to raise all kinds of questions. Don't have uh, uh, Carl Ford or Tom Finger uh, with you. I think that's the way it went down. In any case, uh, Larry Wilkerson was uh, left to, to deal with, with what, he, what he had. And instead of starting tabula rasa, you know, it's five years before, <laughs> five years, five days before the speech, right? Speech was February 5th. 2003, uh, do the math, the invasion happened about six weeks later. Okay, so here, five days, uh, and then George Tenet appears and he says, oh, hey, we have this great intelligence, um, national intelligence estimate, let's use that as the basis. So you know the expression, Scott, garbage in, garbage out, that you did use that, and enhanced it a little bit better. Uh, They even added a little phrase saying, um, there is a sinister nexus, sinister nexus between Saddam Hussein and Al Qaeda. Now, at that point, over 60% of the American people believed, and they believed this because of the propaganda, that Saddam Hussein had something to do with 9-11. Of course he didn't. That he had ties with Al Qaeda. Of course he didn't. They hated each other, but there it was right in the speech. So it's really kind of hard for me to see a title for an article, big article in the New York Times magazine saying Colin Powell still wants answers when he's got all the answers. And so the question arises, and this also occurred to me this morning, he knows that he was deliberately deceived by George Tenet, then head of the whole intelligence community, as well as the CIA. Why doesn't he call him out? Why does, he, why, does he, why does he write a real book uh, and saying, look, this is exactly how it went down at the CIA those five days when we were putting this together. Uh, <laughs> well, that's the this- joke, right? The same moral cowardice that let the scenario play out the way it did in the first place. That's why. Well, yeah, but it's a little bit more than that. Uh, when you take on the professional CIA, it's dangerous, okay? Uh, you don't get invited onto that any talk shows anymore. And it's even more dangerous because other people have experienced some physical problems. Okay. Yeah. But we're talking about Colin Powell here. He is one of the most respected men in America, even now, even after all of this. Well, I mean, he could come out. He has the stature to come out and say, let me tell you the truth about this. All right. And you could ask my pal, Dick Armitage. He'll tell you too, which by the way, there's another guy who always gets to skate as like, yeah, him and Powell were against it. He was also one of the ones who did everything he could to lie us into that war, too. 
I remember him on AM San Antonio AM Radio 550, Carl Wigglesworth and all those guys. They were against the war. They knew better than this crap. They were friends with David Hackworth and stuff. They knew the difference between the mustache and the beard here, you know. And I remember Dick Armitage going on there and saying, we have to do this. Trust me, Carl. We got to do it. People of San Antonio, Saddam Hussein is going to attack us if we don't. Sorry, just had to add that in there. Okay. That, that's that's all true, and all I'm adding is a little codicil, a little corollary to all that, and that is, uh, I just hearken back to the 3rd of January, two, 2017, okay, when President-elect Trump was being briefed on all this kind of thing. What happened on the 3rd of January? You know, maybe your audience doesn't remember, but Rachel Maddow invited Chuck Schumer, uh, the Democratic leader in the Senate uh, to, to be on her show that night. And uh, she said, Chuck, you, ha- you have something important. You said, you still want to tell, share with them. What, what is it? And Chuck says, well, you know, Rachel, I, I, I thought uh, the president elect was a pretty smart guy, you know, a clever businessman. And he would know what kind of quarrels to pick, but he's done something really, really dumb. Oh, oh, what would that be, Chuck? Well, he's picked a fight with the intelligence community, and they have six ways to Sunday to get you. So he's done something really, really stupid. I really am surprised. That was the 3rd of January, 2017. Trump was still president-elect. Two days later, they all got together. That is, I don't think Rachel was included, except uh, by B- BCC, okay? They all got together in the White House and plotted what to do about the president-elect. Too late. We can't prevent him from being being elected. He is. What do we do now? And that's when the fateful decision, a couple of decisions were made, one about uh, Mike Flynn, but the more important one was, should we uh, we blackmail the president? Now, they didn't say it that way, probably, but that's what it meant. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, We have this dossier, uh, which shows- I hear you, and look, Any major politician since the 1960s knows that if you take on the national security state, they might shoot you in the face in Dallas. But if you have that kind of power and influence, then you do the right thing anyway, right? Yeah, well, that's why I say it's a codicil. Uh, Cowardice is the main quality. Uh, The ingrained saluting to the chief is another one. But, you know, there's a real disincentive. That's what I'm trying to make here. I hear you. No, I hear you. But then again, look at you. You spent the last 20 years telling the whole world the truth no matter what. Yeah, but, you know, I I had little to, to risk. I was retired. Uh, when people asked my former colleagues, uh, what about McGovern? They said, oh, you know what they say? <laughs> they would say, oh, he doesn't have access to classified information anymore. So how can he know anything? Yeah. <laughs> I go back to Casey saying 85% of what you need to know is an open source. And I would say, seriously, though, you know what? Colin Powell, he's pretty much untouchable. In fact, look at even Donald Trump. They didn't dare shoot him in the face. I mean, they did frame him for high treason, and that's pretty bad. But they didn't dare kill him, and they wouldn't dare kill Colin Powell. You know, they might leak a sex tape or whatever, try to embarrass him or some kind of thing. But if, if Colin freaking Powell said, you know what, I'm spilling my guts. Here's the whole truth, and it obviously was the truth. He would win. You know, he he'd be have fine. It. And he has a hell of a lot bigger cushion. You might have nothing to lose, but even if he loses one mansion, he has a second, right? Like, he'll be fine. So, um, well, Look, Scott, there are other things be- besides being shot in the face. Uh, it's being deprived of uh, interviews. It's being uh, not allowed to give speeches on Memorial Day. Oh, it's uh, Well, he'd have to go it, big. And look who we're talking about. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I believe in this. I'm just saying I don't think it's so insurmountable. I just think it's a matter of he's a coward. That's all. Yeah. If well, he had any more courage book. whatsoever, yeah. he'd be perfect. And what, he's in his 70s anyway, right? Like he could die of a heart attack at any time. Go ahead and tell the truth, for God's sake. <laughs> well, okay. Well, those Especially are for a black man. Life expectancy is like 68 or something, right? Well, I'm trying to 
tell you that, uh, yeah, you're right. But the real question is why he didn't. And it's not only cowardice, it's fear of, of consequences. And, yeah, uh, fear of other just, men like him. Uh, let's finish uh, uh, January 2017. Um, okay, you got Chuck Schumer telling Rachel Maddow, uh, intelligence community should not be crossed. Uh, they have six ways to Sunday to get back at you. That's the third. The fifth, they get together at the, at the White House, and Comey is given a blessing to lurk behind the next day when they brief Trump and say, and gentlemen, uh, Brennan and Clapper and the other, yeah, would you leave the president and me alone? I have something very, very delicate to, to tell him. And then he tells him about the dossier, okay? He tells him, you know, really, it's not verified, Mr. President. It's very, very scurrilous, but... Uh, they have you cavorting with prostitutes in, in Moscow, and, and, and you know, it's, it's out there. It's going to be published uh, probably the next couple of days. Uh, just, so, just so you know, Mr. Brown, ju just so you know. Now, here's a new guy in town, okay, Trump. He's got a whole different <laughs> experience, life experience, and he doesn't know enough to say what I would have said or what you would have said, uh, Scott. Look, uh, Mr. Comey, thank you very much. Uh, please go back immediately to your, your desk and clean it out because you're out of here as soon as I become president. I know what you're doing. This is J. Edgar Hoover on space. You're trying to blackmail me. Get the hell out of here. That's what that's what uh, he should have said. Instead, he tried to cajole like a real estate broker. He tried to, <laughs> tried to get Comey on his side when Comey had done everything to prevent him from being elected. And now he's trying to do everything to undermine his presidency. So uh, Trump just didn't get it. Now, why do I say all that? I say all that because um, we now know that on the 24th, 25th, and 26th of that same month, the FBI people finally interviewed this uh, source, the subsource, but he was really the real source for Christopher Steele's dossier and found him out <laughs> to be a cockamamie young guy who had worked at the Brookings, Brookings I guess. And, you know, it, 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 he said, none of it's true. Great now, article what? by Paul Sperry this week about yeah. that, by the way, people. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. So, so just to finish this up, why did Comey get authorization from the whole retinue there under Obama uh, to try to blackmail Trump, warn him about, use this dossier in this way, on the 6th, on the 6th of January, 2017, when the FBI already had arranged to interview the subsource, already uh, holding their nose at what they were afraid to get. Why couldn't he have waited just a couple of weeks? <laughs> well, the reason, I guess, is because Obama wasn't around anymore after the 20th of January. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they wouldn't be protected um, if they had started if they had done it earlier. The point is, uh, what's it, 24 minus 6 is what, 18? <laughs> they couldn't have waited 18 days to verify this stuff before they uh, used it as blackmail to, for the president. You know, even Trump, who's not the brightest guy in the world, he's far from the brightest guy in the world, uh, even Trump realized later, he says, you know, I think they were trying to blackmail me. I, yeah, I think that's what they were trying to do. <laughs> so... <laughs> So all I'm saying here is that this is a really intricate stuff. There are really bad guys involved here. And, of course, uh, these guys are the ones that uh, <clears throat> inherited the mantle uh, from people like George Tenet, yep. who deceived Colin Powell and, uh, and promoted all these uh, sycophants uh, to become the leaders of the intelligence community, did a meretricious national intelligence estimate, and they were off and running when they had nothing better to use to help Colin Powell make his speech. Sorry to take on <laughs> to take so long, but you know I'm still. And I'm weird. sorry for interrupting because I didn't realize you were really going somewhere with that. I just know you love talking about RussiaGate so much. But since you did tie it back, let's go ahead and clarify that James Clapper was the head of the surveillance division, the reconnaissance office, and he was the one saying, "Oh yeah, that pig trough, that's a pathway to a." mustard gas <laughs> stockpile or whatever. It was um, essentially verifying all the claims, all the completely false claims of the Iraqi National Congress that yeah. we'll see right there. Now that's a roof. Now we judge with high confidence that under that roof is a bunch of banned stuff. Yep. <laughs> you know. 
And this is the same guy that framed Trump for treason. Or certainly was in on it. He sure was. Hold on just one second. Be right back. So you're constantly buying things from Amazon.com. Well, that makes sense. They bring it right to your house. So what you do, though, is click through from the link in the right-hand margin at scotthorton.org, and I'll get a little bit of a kickback from Amazon's end of the sale. Won't cost you a thing. Nice little way to help support the show. Again, that's uh, right there in the margin at scotthorton.org. Hey, y'all, check it out. The Libertarian Institute, that's me and my friends, have published three great books this year. First is No Quarter, The Ravings of William Norman Grigg. He was the best one of us. Now he's gone, but this great collection is a truly fitting legacy for his fight for freedom. I know you'll love it. Then there's Coming to Palestine by the great Sheldon Richman. It's a collection of 40 important essays he's written over the years about the truth behind the Israel-Palestine conflict. You'll learn so much and highly value this definitive libertarian take on the dispossession of the Palestinians and the reality of their brutal occupation. And last but not least is the great Ron Paul, the Scott Horton Show interviews 2004 through 2019, interview transcripts of all of my interviews of the good doctor over the years on all the wars, money, taxes, the police state, and more. So how do you like that? Pretty good, right? Find them all at libertarianinstitute.org slash books. You need stickers for your band or your business? Well, Rick and the guys over at thebumpersticker.com have got you covered. Great work, great prices, sticky things with things printed on them. Whatever you need, thebumpersticker.com will get it done right for you. Thebumpersticker.com. You know, there's a little history here that's very relevant. Uh, there was always a, uh, a contest between uh, the Department of Defense, the Pentagon, and uh, you know their Defense Intelligence Agency, and the CIA. Now, um, in in uh, um, George Tenet's day, he was uh, he was over both of them. He was head of the whole intelligence community, and so you know he he had a lot to do with who was appointed to do this kind of stuff and who was not. And so, uh, you know, it's it's really really hard uh, to go back and and dissect all of this stuff that went happened. Yeah, let, uh, Scott, let me say a word about James Clapper. Now, um, there was always a, a contest between defense and the CIA as to who would run intelligence. Mm -hmm. The CIA had the charter. Uh, the CIA's head was also head of the whole intelligence community. So when a fellow named John Deutsch in the middle of the 90s had became briefly the head of the CIA, he made no, uh, <clears throat> he did not disguise his wish to become head of uh, defense. His good friend uh, Perry was uh, was the defense secretary. He wanted to take his place, but he left. So what did you do? Like, what can I do to help? What can I do to, to establish my bona fides that I really like the Pentagon more than I like my own CIA? Well, here's something. I have this intelligence uh, analysis unit that analyzes imagery. Now, most people think, oh, those are photographs. No, it's not. Yeah, it's photographs, but it's multispectral. It's radar that can see through roofs. It's uh, uh, you know, multispectral. It's all kinds of imagery. OK. And uh, that was part of this unit called the National Photographic Interpretation Center uh, that found the missiles in Cuba uh, that couldn't be corrupted. Uh, they 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 were good on on verifying uh, trust but verifying they were great okay so what did Deutsch do to ingratiate himself with the Pentagon he gave that unit 950 strong with with decades of experience he gave it to the Pentagon and he said okay now Pentagon you can you can not only run the satellites but now you can run the analysis. That happened in 1996, okay? So here comes Clapper, <clears throat> who was a favorite of Bobby Gates and also a favorite of Tenet. And uh, he comes and becomes Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, and then he becomes head of the National Intelligence, National Imagery and Mapping Agency, which was the successor to the National Photographic Interpretation Center, no longer under CIA, under the Department of Defense. Now, what was his job? Why did Rumsfeld say, oh, this is the guy I want, looking at the satellite photos? Because Clapper would, well, the, the term of art uh, used is lean forward. <laughs> he would lean forward. Like on MSNBC. He, yeah, go ahead. 
he he would do what was necessary to make sure that no sergeant or a lieutenant or a captain or anybody underneath him in that military agency now uh, would would say, hey, you know, Chalabi says that there's a, a, a chemical weapons manufacturing uh, thing here and at these coordinates. <laughs> you, know, you know what it is? It's actually a chicken farm. It's a chicken farm. Well, that would never get up and out because Clapper was the guy running this. Yep. And then he had, the, you know, he's not the brightest star in the, in the constellation either. He wrote a book and he said, you know, I have to give, this is almost the exact quote. I have to give credit, I have to give blame where it's due. Uh, it was not only the policymakers <clears throat> that were plumbing for this war against Iraq, it was the intelligence people, including me, who, and this is a quote, who found things that weren't there, end quote. Yeah. Who found things that weren't there. Maybe that's what Jay Rockefeller, the head of the Senate Intelligence Committee, was referring to when he talked about non-existent intelligence as being part of the, the menu they used to, to justify the war. So here's Clapper. <clears throat> He's got a good record, right? <clears throat> he, he, he successfully suppressed any information and threw any doubt about the weapons of mass destruction. You know, Rumsfeld, who went to Princeton, by the way, uh, and learned lots of things like uh, well, one of his axioms was um, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And that you was in that? direct response to a question. What's the proof that Saddam is an ally of Osama bin Laden? <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> and he went, well, you know, here's yeah. a riddle. <laughs> So the, the answer to that, of course, is the, the absence of evidence that Saddam had uh, weapons of mass destruction didn't mean they weren't there. Yeah. Even though we're spending billions and billions and billions on these sophisticated satellite systems. And now it didn't matter because Clapper was head of analysis and Clapper wouldn't let the truth come out. So right. he Clapper was the same guy, of course, who perjured himself before the Senate and the American people under oath and said that they weren't spying on the American people, collecting our emails and our phone That's calls and location data and the rest, which, of course, he knew was yeah. false at the time. So how does he get to be director of national intelligence? The job that Tenet had back in the day when there was a dual hat yeah. head of the CIA. And so how did he get that job? Well. Reward for lying us into Iraq? Oh, yeah. Well, Obama asked for, you know, Obama didn't know what's up. He asked his friend Brennan and he asked uh, his the secretary of defense at the time, Bobby Gates, who would be a good guy to head up the whole intelligence community. <laughs> and they said, as with, as if with one voice, James Clapper, he's just the guy. And so Obama uh, appoints Clapper as head of the whole intelligence community. Let, let me A million dead this. Iraqis can't be wrong because they're <laughs> dead. Yeah. Let me finish with this little vignette because it's true. When I lived in Washington, I used to make a habit of going to these conferences where people like uh, James Clapper would be holding forth. Now, it was very hard to find such conferences or to get in, but this time he was hawking his book, the same book that bragged about finding things that weren't there. Woo, wow. So I got there 15 minutes early, <clears throat> bought the book, which was hard to do, but I bought it, $35. And then I quickly looked at it and found <laughs> found this quote. So I asked him about that. And I was like, like one of the questioners, uh, Mr. Clapper, now you admit that as head of intelligence, uh, imagery intelligence, you leaned forward to support uh, Bush and Cheney and, quote, as you say in your book here, found things that weren't there. Now, uh, Mr. Clapper, let me let me ask you, fast forward. Now you're working for a different administration, uh, the Obama administration, and they're, uh, they're really, really intent on proving that the Russians hacked the Democratic National Committee, and we know there's no proof of that. Is this is this one of those cases where you were leaning forward, where where you actually found things that weren't there? <laughs> well, I, this was at Carnegie, right? And all, <laughs> so I'm the skunk at the picnic again, right? Well, his answer speaks volumes. He says, "Oh no, 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 we no, 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 no." He said the forensics were incredible. Well, somebody needs to ask Clapper, uh, if the forensics were incredible, 
And the only people that did the forensics was a, a, a DNC paid outfit named CrowdStrike. And the head of CrowdStrike on the 7th of December 2017 said, and I quote, there is no concrete evidence that the DNC emails were exfiltrated. Exfiltrated, 35 cent word for hacked, okay? They weren't exfiltrated, or we have no proof that they're exfiltrated by Russia or by anybody else. Um, and usually we can tell, but this time we can't tell. That was the 7th of December, 2017. All those House Intelligence Committee members knew that, and it wasn't until May 7th, 2020, like, well, do the math. I, that's three months ago. Uh, do your listeners know that the head of CrowdStrike has disavowed any evidence that the Russians oh, or anybody Oh, my else? listeners know. <laughs> they do know. But, uh, <laughs> there are a lot, uh, many, I'll tell you what, MSNBC's viewers and CNN's viewers don't know. Yeah. Well, um, New York Times but, and here's know. the thing, too. If the FBI has any other evidence, well, they can go ahead and release that and put up or shut up then. Yeah. With but, their the lesson, but now wait a right. minute, because I just got to let you know here that we're still not quite done trashing Colin Powell, I don't think. And we only have 15 <laughs> minutes and we still need to leave you an opportunity to trash Mike Pompeo and the current danger, which is picking a fight with China. So you do what you want, Ray, but I'm just saying budget your time carefully. Yeah. Well, let's see. Do we need to finish up on this other stuff? I guess we do, just to say that it's going to be really interesting these next three months. Um, Clapper, Brennan, Comey, uh, they were so sure that Hillary was going to win that they didn't even hide their tracks when they tried to make sure she won. And when they, after she lost, they tried to derail everything uh, uh, Trump wanted to do. Now, Bear in mind, I hold no brief for Trump. I think he's the worst president we ever had. But, you know, there is something called the Constitution, and uh, my oath to uh, support and defend the Constitution does not expire, okay? So it's going to be interesting to see if uh, Bill Barr and uh, Donald Trump, who talk the good game, who name names like Clapper and Brennan and Comey, whether they tell their special prosecutor Oh, it's a little dangerous. They have six ways to send it to get back. You know, send that guy to jail that that falsified that one email, but let the others off with a slap on the wrist. I am fearful that that's going to happen. And then we'll have the deep state briefing the new president in the same way that uh, uh, that Comey briefed uh, uh, Donald Trump. So that that's that's the current issue here. Uh, and uh, Clapper and Comey and Brennan still have a lot of support, uh, not only by MSNBC and CNN and all that stuff, but by operatives who are involved or were involved and owe their careers to, to these guys. So just to finish up on that, well, here's, here's Pompeo, Pompus Pompeo. Hey, here's a tie in. Wait, wait, hang on on China. Here's a tie in Here. back to Colin Powell. And this sounds so stupid that I am sure people must think that I'm the kook when I bring this up. But I swear to God, it was on the front page of the New York Times. They covered it repeatedly. You can find it all over the place. That the Clinton people were behind this, too. They were avowedly behind it. They wanted the acting director of the CIA, Michael Morell, to brief the Electoral College that Vladimir Putin had stolen the election from Hillary Clinton and that mm -hmm. they should vote for Hillary Clinton. And if they yep. wouldn't do that, then they should at least decide to hang the jury and send it to the House of Representatives so that the House of Representatives can appoint a good Republican like Paul Ryan or Colin Powell to be the president. <laughs> That's a nice And then someone letter. informed them that these electors come from the states. If you think that they're going to turn on Donald Trump, you're smoking crack. It's just never going to happen, so you might as well forget it. And they did drop it. Yeah. Well, this was a last-ditch effort. You know, they had lost on every score. Uh, so you're right, and no, nobody knows this. They asked Powell, hey, if you, put your, if you let your name be uh, in Oregon or something like that, then the, the rules would allow you to be president if we could, uh, if we could rig it this way. Will you do it? And yeah, what did Cole Powell say? Oh, no, no, on principle, I wouldn't do it. No, he saluted smartly. 
and said, yes, sir, of course, put my name in there. So, yeah. Amazing. That was sort of Just cash. amazing. Uh, you know, <laughs> Mr. Speaking of constitutional oaths and everything. Oh, what? We're going to do a coup d'etat? Yeah, you guys can count on me. Says the guy that lied oh. us into a wreck or two. And now, wait a yeah. minute, because this really goes to his guilt, too. I think it's really important. You include the clip in your great uh, piece at Consortium News. It's very short. It's just Colin Powell from the beginning of 2001, the first couple of months, the spring, um, long before the September 11th attack, the very beginning of the George W. Bush uh, first term there. And it's Colin Powell explaining that he knows good and well that Iraq is helpless before American might here and poses no threat to us whatsoever. But there was no threat from Saddam Hussein. He has not developed any significant capability with respect to weapons of mass destruction. He is unable to project conventional power against his neighbors. All right, there you go. So, and that is, the, that's not him in the 90s, you know, musing on a Sunday morning TV show or something. That was when he was the sitting Secretary of State a couple of months, two or three months into the government. So he had been presumably briefed uh, by the Bureau of Intelligence and Research on exactly what Hussein's capabilities were. And there he was telling the truth that we have him in a box, as Condoleezza Rice said. Uh, he has no capability to do a thing, and that's why we're not worried about changing the status quo right now. That's right. Now, Poland, uh, Poland Cowell, <laughs> Colin Powell said that on the 22nd of February 2001. Uh, okay, when? Said Early, that. but still, you know, a month into, still time to be briefed. You know, he wasn't reading well, this in the paper. It was a month into well, his job as Secretary of State. I was just trying to point out that the, it was Condoleezza Rice in July of 2001, so just, uh, what, two months before 9-11. So it was as if we were being asked to believe that whereas Saddam Hussein had no weapons of mass destruction uh, in July uh, 2001, all of a sudden, right after 9-11, uh, weapons of mass destruction descended uh, from the heavens like manna uh, for soft landing on the sands of Iraq where God uh, made that big mistake of putting our oil, right? I mean, it was that blatant and that, but but you know what? That was John Pilger you heard first. That was from a, uh, a Breaking the Silence um, uh, documentary. Mm -hmm. He interviewed me for that, okay? And the reason I, I, I mention that is that uh, he was convinced that, that, of course, this was uh, all cockamamie stuff, and this was right after the invasion. And uh, I said, John, uh, you sent me this advanced copy. It's great, but where did you find that footage on Colin Powell and, and Condoleezza Rice? <laughs> and he said, Ray, uh, you know, I'm a... I'm an investigative reporter. And um, so I got all the tapes from everything these guys said in that, in that period of time. And I went into a booth and, and people feared for my sanity. But I listened and I watched and I found them. Oh, that's what investigative reporters do, Ray. <laughs> so why it was it not in the media? Well, because, of course, it was struck out in the media when they wanted to find uh, the uh, weapons of mass destruction that James Clapper leaned forward to the extent of, quote, finding things that were not there. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's how bad it was. And, uh, yep. you know, i would say one more thing about Colin Powell. This is sort of a personal thing. I, I used to, I know him. I used to brief him when I, I carried the president's daily brief to his boss, a fellow named Weinberger, who was secretary of defense. And I used to sit down with Colin 10 minutes before, and try to reassure him that I wasn't telling his boss anything that he needed to know or, or at least try to, you know, assuage his concerns on that score. And I know him. He came, as I say, from a neighborhood one mile away from me in the Bronx. But you know what? When he came in, we're all immigrants, right? I from Ireland, and, or my parents or grandparents from Ireland, and his from Jamaica. Now, I had the good luck of having my Irish grandmother live with us, right? And she repeated again and again, Raymond. Be truthful and honest, and they won't give a damn what anyone says about you, okay? That was drilled into my head. Colin Powell had no grandmother living with him. He had just people who were trying to make it, people who were so proud of him having that uniform and being promoted and promoted and promoted. And that speaks volumes. You need somebody to ground you, okay? And I had that, and Colin Powell didn't. And in that respect, I feel sorry for him. Yeah, well... Geez, think of all the people without grandmothers who don't kill a million people. Hey, um, 
So here's this article in the New York Times Magazine that your article is about here. And I really regret that I did not have the time to go back and reread it and take notes because it is absolutely outrageous, some of the garbage in there and all the self-serving, self-servingness. Uh, it's really terrible. And I hope people will read it. And I'm really looking forward to reading this book, too. I already ordered it to start a war, how the Bush administration took America into Iraq. And I feel bad because I just, you know, wrote about half a chapter about that and then threw it out because I was getting too deep into the details. I was trying to write a briefer thing. So I'll publish that someday and it probably won't be as good as this guy's book. But anyway, it's very important. Um, the story of how they lied us into Iraq War II and his culpability in it all. Uh, so with that, uh, can I get a good seven minutes on uh, what you think about Pompeo and the not sure. so new Cold War with China here? Yeah, a final word on Iraq, a very brief one. Uh, we did a trilogy two weekends ago. When I say we, I mean Scott Ritter, who knew chapter and verse about the fact that this war in Iraq was not about weapons of mass destruction, it was about regime change, and he could prove it. And Joe Lauria, who was at the UN the day that uh, he, he was a correspondent of the UN at the time, he was there when Colin Powell gave his speech, and he bumped into the British ambassador in the elevator, and he said, what the hell's going on here? And the British ambassador said, well, the United States wants to make a war, and of course we're going to help them make a war. <laughs> so if you want the whole trilogy, Lauria, Scott Ritter, and me, uh, you can go to my website. I have them all grouped together. The website is raymcgovern.com, and it's easily searchable. Right, and people can now, also look up, just type in Scott Ritter in Tokyo, and you'll get a great article about him and his real-time reaction uh, in a speech he gave in Tokyo, Japan, right after Colin Powell's speech, debunking every bit of it in real time. See, he had tried to, uh, he had tried to persuade Joe Biden who was the then head of the Senate Foreign, Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, to let him speak and, and tell them that there were no weapons and he could verify it. But Biden said, no, no, you can't speak. Anyhow, OK, Pompeo. Pompeo's speech on China is unhinged. Uh, it's something like uh, we used to see back in the, the worst days of the Cold War. Uh, it says that we need to change China. I mean, that's our job. And uh, Nixon, for all his wisdom and cleverness in opening the opening China up to us, uh, and the way he used that as leverage with the Russia, that was good. But what Richard what Richard Nixon really wanted was to change China, to change the regime, to make them more like us. And that's our mission now. That's our mission now. And be and and besides, please don't forget, all communists lie. All communists lie, and you know what? They, uh, all communists lie. <laughs> They're really bad. His, this is from the guy who says, you know, when I was at the military academy, oh, we, we had this ethics code, moral honor code, uh, you don't lie, cheat, or steal, or uh, tolerate anybody who does. <laughs> but then I became a CIA director, and we lied, and we cheated, and we steal. We had courses on that. Uh, how about that for the great American experiment? period, end quote. <laughs> Is Pompeo pompously now getting up and saying, ah, look, you know, all these communists lie. They always lie. So what's he, what's he after here? Well, the bottom line is the Mickey Mat. Now, we used to call it the MIC, the Military Industrial Complex. Now we, that is McGovern's uh, editorial we, uh, the Military Industrial Congressional Intelligence Media Academia Think Tank complex. Mickey Matt. Why do I say media? Because media is the cornerstone. It's the sine qua non. None of it would work unless you could portray China and Russia as threats to us so that we can justify the huge defense expenditures that take 60 cents now out of every dollar we contribute in our, in our taxes. And leave what? Leave what for COVID-19? Leave what? Leave very little. So that's the name of the game here. They're trying to assuage the uh, military industrial complex. Um, Mickey Matt, they're all Mickey, Mickey Matt tears. Um, you know, there was proof of this. Uh, uh, in December, when China started becoming a great threat all of a sudden, uh, General Dynamics was given a uh, unprecedented uh, two, no, $22.2 billion, billion with a B as in boy, contract to build nine or 10 
submarines that will be online maybe seven years from now. And it was all justified by what? By the threat from China. When that courageous captain out there of uh, the Teddy Ro the, the USS Theodore Roosevelt aircraft carrier out near Guam wanted to hermetically seal his crew, uh, the ones that were starting to get COVID, uh, he was said, no, you can't do that. And he said, why not? Because of the threat from China. Well, there is no threat from China unless we start sailing in Chinese waters. And you know what's going to happen then? You know what's going to happen then? The Chinese are going to take a shot at us before very long. And then uh, we're going to have a two-front problem because relations between Russia and China are so close now that I would not rule out the fact that there would be disturbances uh, about Ukraine or Syria or even uh, elsewhere in, in Europe, just so that the, the Russians and Chinese would remind the world, and especially the United States, look, we're together now. Uh, far from being exploited in this triangular relationship, you're the one. You're the one that's uh, disadvantaged now. And if you start trouble uh, seven thousand miles away from your own shores in the South China Sea, you know not only do you have to worry about retaliation there, but you know you you might uh, you might face a two front problem. Be aware of that. We're together now. And you know Pompeo is oblivious to all this. Nobody's going to tell him this. And so he uh, prances and he, he, well, you know, it was a really bad performance. I watched it. I could hardly, well, I, I, I wrote that article. It's worth reading, I think. Uh, and, you know, what happened was after, after that happened, um, uh, Richard Haas, whose distinction was running policy planning uh, staff under uh, and Bush uh, right before the Iraq war. So he was complicit in that. He wrote an article that was pretty not not so bad for him, and then Chess Freeman, who who is a U.S. ambassador to to um, well to various places, but also was Nixon's interpreter when Nixon went to Beijing in uh, February of 2000 <laughs> February 1972. Uh, he he chimed in, so we had a sort of colloquium, and the article that emerged was uh, something that I wrote, but I quoted. Uh, Chaz extensively, and I included background from my own experience because I was CIA's analyst referent for Sino-Soviet relations back in the 60s, mind you, and early 70s, and I could speak of how, how things evolved from that very, very bitter relationship. We thought that they would hate each other forever. We thought, uh, to paraphrase uh, uh, James Clapper, uh, that they were almost genetically driven to, <laughs> to hate each other forever. Well, we were wrong. It was just a decade later where there was a big thaw in uh, Sino-Soviet relations. And now, and now, well, uh, trade is over $100 billion, whereas back in the day, I'm talking the 60s, it was $200 million. Big difference. So, yeah, so Pompeo doesn't know what he's talking about. He's playing to... Uh, um, uh, to the audience that he thinks will get him elected president in five years. Yeah. And, you know, he's, he's and back done. to Colin Powell here to wrap up too. he, mm, yeah, he was the guy who tamped everything down back when the spy plane got shot down in 2001, because instead mm. of just serving the military industries, he was thinking about all the other industries as you're talking about, who are so dependent on investment and trade with China and who must have peace at all costs. And thank yeah. God for that. <laughs> Instead, you have guys like Pompeo who's like, well, I don't know. I know some shipbuilders who like my policy, and that's good enough for him. Well, it's against the interests of all of the rest of the American people, including all the rest of big business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was Eisenhower himself that said uh, every bullet that is produced, every weapon that's made deprives the people of the United States of the basic necessities of life. And man, we have that on, on steroids right now, don't we? I mean, what, what more is needed to prove that our investment in this so-called offense, which is really offense, is really just a, a, a reward for people who have, who have a lot of money and who want to invest still more money in uh, what I call the military, industrial, congressional, intelligence, media, academia, think tank complex. They're all in it together. 
And most Americans are deceived because they listen to the media. Yep, you're totally right. As George Carlin said, there's a big club. You're not in it. <laughs> and in it. I'm pretty sure that's what he was talking about. <laughs> We can look in the mirror in the morning, Scott, and we say, we're not in it. <laughs> yeah, I was certainly not. All right, now listen, I got to run because I got to interview Gareth Porter about the Hezbollah getting framed over the Argentina bombing of 1994. So that's, that should be fun. Yep. Good man, Gareth Porter. <laughs> oh, of course. The best of the best. That's why he's on next after you. Uh, thanks very much, Ray. Appreciate it. Love talking to you. Well, I know. All right, you guys, that is the great Ray McGovern. Of course, he's at consortiumnews.com, raymcgovern.com, and antiwar.com. Look at this one. Presumptuous Pompeo pushes preposterous Peking policy. And then, uh, of course, before that, uh, Powell is the worst person in the world. The Scott Horton Show and Anti-War Radio can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in L.A. APSradio.com, antiwar.com scotthorton.org and libertarianinstitute.org.